Not registered for the course? No? No auditors? Nobody? Okay. All right. Uh, let's get started. It seems like everyone is here. Uh, I am Sepe, and I'm going to be your lecturer for computer vision for uh, this year. Many of you already have seen me, and uh, I'm glad you are here. Uh, usually, the cap for a course here at City is 60 people, but the moment the, the modules were open and you could choose, 77 people chose computer vision. So we either had to, uh, you know, let some people go randomly or like time wisely, but we decided to keep people and those who really are interested in computer vision, I'm happy to have you here, all of you. Now we are about 90 people and uh, this is going to be a very crowded module. Uh, they have assigned three labs to us, and each lab has a capacity of 30 people. So uh, hopefully there will be enough room for us all. Uh, labs are not compulsory, but you are encouraged to attend if you want to. Uh, also, the lectures are uh, live, not live, like in two hours you will be, once the classes are over, you can watch them online on Moodle. There will be a link, and uh, it looks something like this. Uh, this is the lecture capture area. So if you do not want to be seen, or you, you've told someone that you're somewhere else and you don't want to be seen here, I don't know, then uh, avoid this area. <laughs> and uh, you can see which area it is. I, I tried to look exactly like what I looked last year, and this is my coffee, so uh, just to resemble it, the same exact setup. So. Um, this will be online. You can uh, watch the lecture capture after the lectures are done. And I encourage you to attend all the lectures, but if for any reason you cannot come, then you can uh, watch it later. So uh, this is, uh, I already sent an, uh, a message to the news. Did everyone receive that? Yeah? Okay. So you're all registered and uh, ready to go. There is a discussion forum as well, which we will use. I will tell you later about it. So uh, this is the timetable for uh, the location of the class. And uh, only next week, for some reason, this room is booked and they have assigned us to a different, book, different room. Uh, we will be in AG21 next week, but for the rest of the module, we will be here. So uh, the labs are also the same. They, we have ELG06 and 7 and 10. But uh, for next week, uh, there won't be ELG 10, and we will have A218 uh, instead of that. So uh, tonight's lecture is going to be a slightly longer, and the lab is going to be shorter. And if you want, you can avoid the lab in total, because it's just basic MATLAB. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with MATLAB and have already done some programming in it. But if you haven't, there are tutorials online and there, the lab notes are online. And these slides are all online as well. You can download them from Moodle uh, right away at, at, uh, as, a, as I'm speaking. So um, I will try to go through admin stuff tonight. We will decide on your coursework tonight together um, and uh, see how you can enjoy this course more. So let's start with an introduction to what computer vision is. And uh, then we will go through some admin stuff. So what is computer vision? Uh, by definition, it's a scientific discipline that studies how computers can efficiently perceive, process, and understand visual data, such as images and videos. So we all have cameras. And uh, they are very good quality, much better than they were like 10 years ago. But uh, understanding images is what we talk about. We are not going to process images to make them look nicer or Photoshop them. We will learn how those things work as well. But what we are trying to achieve here is, for example, if I show you an image and say, who is this person? If I show you an image and say, is this a cat or a dog? So this is what we mean by computer vision. It has different uh, subfields which we will touch on. Computer vision is really, really big these days, and uh, many of you will probably find yourself a job in computer vision because there is a very, very high demand in market at the moment. Uh, on my way back to uh, London last week, I was going through this Business Life magazine in uh, British Airways, and uh, the interesting thing that caught my eye was the 10 trends for 2019, and one is machine vision. So 
you can see how big it has become and why is it so recent, why computer vision has been there for many decades, but recently we have the computational power, we have the algorithms that are actually working. Before that, everything was just like science fiction, but now things are happening. We can actually recognize faces. We can open our phones with looking at it and someone else who looks like us and looks at it doesn't open it usually. So uh, this is uh, why computer vision is so uh, in demand and it's a hot topic these days. And I want you to pay very, very good attention. Put your phones away. Forget about chatting for two hours. Tell them you're busy on a date or something and uh, try to concentrate because this is going to be a really useful course for you. I'm doing my best uh, to make it as useful as possible. So uh, just a few examples of what applications computer vision has. Uh, first thing is uh, what we are very familiar with is uh, face detection, which is something that is very old. We already have cameras that once we look at some, uh, you know, we focus on a group of people, it detects faces in it. So face detection is not something new. It has been there for a long time. And in this course, we will learn how it works and how you will write your own face detectors. Then the next step is face recognition. Once you look at a person, you, you find a face. Now you will tell whether this is your friend or not. This is someone you know or not. The other application is object detection and identification or classification. So we have a scene, uh, and this is now so powerful that in Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, when I was uploading some images, it was giving me suggestions for what is inside the photo. And uh, you can see it's now already uh, embedded in many applications. It is there, so we will learn how we can do that as well. So object detection and classification are one of the very important uh, applications of computer vision, as you will see in the rest of these uh, module. We have uh, not only images and videos, we have also other sources of information that can help us understand the environment better, such as depth images, like a Kinect, if, if you have it. It also generates a heat map of the depths, and then you can realize which object is closer, which object is further. If you have a PS4 or Xbox, you have played those games that you can dance in front of your computer and it can in front of your camera and it can detect your moves and gives you scores, things like that. Uh, the other application is augmented reality. It is also a very hot topic these days, especially in uh, surgeries, where a doctor is trying to use a robot or computer vision to do a surgery, and they want information on where they are. So augmented reality adds information that is already seen. Like, for example, you have preoperative images, very high quality images, but in the intraoperative, there is blood there, there is occlusion, the camera is not really going to detect well, then they, they import the good quality images, they create a very beautiful map, and then you can see where you are, so that is augmented reality. We also have virtual reality, which you can play games, like you can imagine you're in an environment, and uh, you will keep playing, and that is, um, uh, another very interesting application. Uh, one of the very important applications of computer vision is in medical images. So as I mentioned now, uh, you have some high quality images you want to extract information from. And uh, one of the early papers like uh, I had about uh, uh, six, seven years ago in medical images was uh, looking at uh, the uh, images of breast cancer. And those images are huge, like a doctor has to go through histopathology images, they, they each are a few gigabytes, and if a doctor really wants to go through them, it takes hours to go through the whole image. So what we did, we wrote a program that could detect sensitive areas, areas that we were suspected, that we were suspecting that there might be cancer here. So instead of going through an image of like 10 hours of time of a doctor, which is very, very expensive and rare, and you cannot really get that, the doctors usually go through that and see, okay, this might be something, they zoom in, oh yeah, there is something, or if they miss it, they have missed it. But what we did was, and what is actually being done is, you give them suggestions, look at this area, and this area, and this area. So instead of going through 10 hours, they look only for like 10 seconds and say, oh yes, there is cancer here, or no, there is no cancer. So it makes, uh, it gives us a lot of uh, opportunities. So what you will learn in this course, what can you expect? As I mentioned now, some examples of computer vision. Computer vision is a very, very broad topic. 
And uh, in most courses of computer vision around, they usually focus on something and they go deep in it. But uh, once we uh, created this course basically four years ago, a former colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Sleba Greg, was here and he's now left University for Industry. Uh, four years ago, we uh, decided that we want, there is no computer vision course in city. We have to do it here. So we started this course. And the idea we had was, instead of going very deep in some basic topics, which are outdated, we decided to go very broad, but very shallow. So in this course, you will learn a lot of things. And once you find yourself interested in one specific subfield, then dig in. Go ahead and see what is out there for you. There are lots of videos on YouTube. There are lots of videos on all of these um, uh, platforms, educational platforms online like Udemy, like uh, other ones. You can just see what you are interested in and go through that. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to cover a lot of topics. And you will learn a lot of things from image segmentation, classification, detection, uh, 3D images. Uh, there is a bug in the new Mac update, and it just keeps going back to one slide that it likes more. So it keeps going back to that slide. It was on three other Macs in the last two weeks that I have seen. So um, if it goes there, let me know if I'm just talking about something totally irrelevant. Uh, so what we will talk about in this course is uh, first, in this session, we will have a relaxed session. Most of the matter, materials on this session will not be on the exam, but please don't leave yet. And uh, it's going to be a fun one, because in this one you will learn how human brain works, how human visual system works actually, how we see things, how we understand things, what is the difference between sensation and perception. Because once we sense something, it's not necessarily the same as once we perceive something. We might be uh, wrong, which we will see today. We will go through uh, next week. We will talk about basics of computer uh, image processing. Now we know how humans see images, how humans understand the environment around them. Now we want to see what language computers see images as. What, what do images mean to a computer and why computer vision is a difficult field and nowadays it is easier. Nowadays it is doable. Previously it was all theories. The best algorithms were competing in the range of 50%, 60% accuracy. But nowadays you're competing in the range of 98%, 98.1, 98.2 accuracy. So we want to see what's happening there. Uh, then we will talk about features. What is important in an image? We will talk about segmentation. Let's say this is, a, this is a sky, this is sand, this is trees in the image, and so on. So we segment the images. This is cancer, cancerous area, this is normal area, and so on. Uh, we will have a look at video analysis, 3D vision, what a video is actually, how it works, how we can analyze videos, how we can understand a moving car in, an, in a video. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, machine learning at all, in this course, I will, in two lectures, teach you computer uh, machine learning. So if you do not know machine learning, there are usually courses, like it takes 20 lectures for one concept. But as I said, shallow but broad. We will talk about understanding uh, machine learning in two lectures. One is about unsupervised learning, and one is about supervised learning. So we will have those two uh, lectures. They should be lecture five and six, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then on lecture seven, we will talk about deep learning. So in one lecture, you will understand the general concepts about deep learning and find your orientation, where, where you want to go, which direction you want to actually go for uh, deep learning. Uh, the last three lectures are not confirmed yet. Uh, it doesn't mean they won't be uh, held. They will be, don't worry. But uh, we may have different guest speakers. Greg might join us, Professor Sleva. He might be giving us uh, two guest lectures. And I may also extend them to more uh, deep learning stuff. So for now, uh, we know that the first seven lectures are very, very important. And they are going to be from basics of image processing to deep learning. So if you attend and focus and pay attention to these seven lectures and also do some homework, by end of week seven, you will be able to run your own face uh, recognizer, for example, and things like that. And uh, there are some references for this course, but 
because computer vision is a very dynamic course and every year what you have from last year is outdated. Once you learn the basics, then the rest is usually on Google. So you have to read papers, you have to be updated. And uh, what you need to do is, uh, these, refer these references are here. You can look at them, but they are not mandatory. There won't be any questions from them that there aren't in the lecture, so they are just additional references. Most of the material for tonight is going to be from the Goldstein's book, Sensation and Perception. It's a very interesting book. If you ordered it for the library, you can borrow it there. It's a very interesting book on human brain. So it's just not only vision. Uh, vision is only one or two chapters of this book. The rest is about our haptic senses, uh, smelling, tasting, and other senses that we have and how actually we sense the environment around us and how we perceive the environment, what different layers are in the brain, which part of brain does what, and things like that. But we are only focused on computer vision, and again, very shallow. We want to generally understand the concepts, the basics. This is not a biology class. So uh, we talked about the administrative details. Uh, lectures will be two hours from six to eight here, and then we will have a one-hour tutorial or lab uh, in um, nearby rooms. Uh, and uh, the labs are usually, you, ha you have the instructions online already. So you will, you will be able to see what they are. You don't have to attend the labs. If I know it's late, you're all uh, like 8 to 9 p.m. is not really the best time. But you are welcome to stay. There will be two or three teaching assistants with me, uh, Abby and Alex, who are not here yet, but they will join us for the lab. And uh, they will be there if you have any questions, if you have trouble running some code, if you are getting some bugs that you cannot debug. Uh, we will be there for you to help, but you can also do it at home. And uh, if you have questions, uh, you can email me or meet Alex and Abby. Or if you couldn't solve that, then we can arrange a meeting together and we will go through that. So uh, I am not based in city. I am uh, basically based in UCL and uh, I don't have office hours here. But if you need me, if there is something that I have to be there for you, we will definitely arrange that or we can communicate through email. My email account is here, and this is Abby and Alex's emails. So if you have questions uh, or you need to meet uh, any of us, just drop us an email and we will take it from there. So uh, no mobile phones, no Netflix, no chatting. Please, during the lectures, try to not to sleep and uh, focus. It's a very, very, uh, I try to make it interesting. I know it's not that easy, but I try to uh, have your attention, hopefully. Uh, ideally, attend all lectures and all labs, but I won't be calling a roll. If you miss one session or two, it's your loss, not mine. So try to attend. That's uh, as far as I can go. And uh, because, you know, some students, I, I had this experience, some students didn't attend any lectures, they didn't watch the uh, videos online, and like one week before the uh, coursework, they start complaining, this is too difficult, I don't understand, and they start panicking, and uh, then they fail, and uh, that's not good. So uh, the other thing is, if you are planning to buy a laptop, which I recommend if you can, uh, try to buy something that is a CUDA compatible GPU on it uh, because with that you can uh, run deep learning models much, much faster than on a standard CPU. So a model that, and they are, nowadays they are very cheap, they are not that expensive, but unfortunately Apple is not supporting that anymore and um, the problem is Apple is trying to design their own. Uh, this, this computer was, was a good one. I was using it for a long time for deep learning applications. But unfortunately, Apple and NVIDIA, yeah? What about OpenCL? Uh, OpenCL, it's, uh, it's very, very useful. Uh, I'm not, uh, what I'm talking about is about um, CUDA applications running on a GPU. So Apple is going towards OpenCL, and they are developing their own GPU technology. They are not. Uh, it's up to you. I, I'm, not, I'm not limiting you at all. Uh, but there is a lot more op, uh, options for you out there if you are using CUDA. So uh, most of these platforms are supporting CUDA. And uh, uh, anyway, yeah, it, it's a good thing to have a, a CUDA compatible GPU. So um, Apple doesn't support that anymore. So yeah, that's <laughs> the moral of the story. 
And uh, your assessment for this course will be, uh, I tried to change this, but it seems to be impossible. So you will be having a 50% coursework and a 50% final exam. Uh, undergrads and postgrads are going to have a separate coursework, which is very similar, but just a bit more limited for the undergrads. But uh, the exams and the labs and all the rest are going to be the same. Uh, this due date is the last possible date that I could give you uh, because I wanted to be, you know, as generous as possible, give you as much time and give myself as little time as possible to mark it. So I tried to go as far as I could. This is the last possible date, but think of it as mid-April. Don't, don't leave it until the, that day because like a couple of days after that, your exams will start. So this is the ultimate date you have, but try to go like a bit earlier than that from now. So see, this is 21st of January. You have a lot of time. Don't come like in May and ask for more time. Uh, the, the projects, I, I'm going to discuss about your coursework, what we can do. There are options. Uh, for coding, as I mentioned, uh, this course is based on MATLAB. So uh, there is MATLAB 2018A installed on all, all the machines in the university. Uh, there is a newer version released, 2018B. So if you are using your own laptop for running MATLAB, try to install 2018B. It has more features. It has uh, better deep learning uh, uh, stuff on it. But uh, there will be a 2019A usually. There, there are the pre-release ones come usually in March. So you can also uh, get that. They usually have more uh, features. But the problem with the pre-release version is they don't have a good help. Um, MATLAB is a very good choice for academic purposes because you don't pay for it. And uh, MATLAB is very, very expensive. If you want to buy a license, I think it's in the order of tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, if you want to buy a, a license, unless you're a student, which you are. And for university uh, license, it is free. It is already provided to you. The problem with that is, because of that, industry doesn't like it, because they don't like to pay for software. They prefer to go open source. So if you are looking at a job in industry, definitely start working with Python. And uh, there are a lot of good libraries for Python online for computer vision. OpenCV, for instance, is a very, very good library you can use. And uh, you can use TensorFlow, which is a platform for deep learning, which has Keras on top of it, which makes uh, programming deep learning easier. You can use um, uh, there, are, there are different uh, platforms which I will mention later. But anyway, uh, the labs in this course will be uh, in MATLAB. So uh, I will try to provide some Python material, but there are uh, references out there you can uh, choose. So uh, these are the reasons why we are working with MATLAB. It is easier. It is easier to uh, visualize your results. It has a very, very, uh, you know, the, the good thing about MATLAB is one company is developing it. So everything is there and there are no uh, clashes of versions on it. Because in Python, sometimes there are different releases of the same thing and you have to make sure you're using the right release, not the, the other one, which is going to have uh, problems with that. So uh, in this uh, module, uh, mathematics and MATLAB are important. Uh, but I have tried my best to make this module. Computer vision is a very mathematically intense field if you want to do especially 3D vision and video analysis. But I have tried to make it uh, as light as possible mathematical wise. And there is a primer you can download from Moodle where there are some, you know, just to uh, freshen up your math, you can download them and have a look what matrices are, how did we multiply them, what convolution is, and things like that. There are simple things, and I will go through the major important ones during the lecture. So don't worry if you are not excellent in math, but uh, we will try. Uh, the module description asks you to spend 10 to 12 hours each week for homework. There is no homework, so what I suggest is use this wisely. Try to go through the lecture notes. There, as I mentioned, there are like courses on Udemy for like 10 pounds or so, 
and you can uh, enroll on one of them and start learning. Uh, there are courses like Python for computer vision or uh, deep learning in Python, deep learning for TensorFlow and things like that. You can just, the prices are usually like 200 pounds and then there is always a sale of 95%. So you can usually buy them at 10 pounds. This is their marketing strategy. And uh, there are lots of videos available on YouTube which you can uh, watch anytime. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is try to devote this time to this course. This is, this is a very, very important thing to be updated, to see what's happening in this field. I try to uh, keep you up to date with, as much as I can, but uh, it's always important that uh, you be better than me in, in this field. You have to be more updated you, you, because you are students and I am old. So what you have to do is you have to try to uh, catch up, see what's happening, and be always on the edge. I'm not that old. Uh, so uh, just a brief... Uh, uh, introduction to myself. Uh, I have a PhD in computer vision from National University of Singapore where I was working on simulating hierarchical structure of human visual cortex. So during my PhD I was looking at human brain trying to see what is basically happening and how we can simulate it. At the time my PhD contribution was improving the classification accuracy from 54 percent to 60 percent and once I submitted my thesis and it was done, next year something was released with 85% in deep learning. So you can see how deep learning has changed and everything is now uh, focused about uh, deep learning. So uh, doing a management of technology uh, graduate certificate course in Singapore, I did a postdoc research fellowship. Uh, in uh, Tropical Marine Sciences Institute in Singapore and I was working on understanding dolphins brain this time. So uh, as you know dolphins have uh, a very good sonar system. They can, it's like bats, they send signals to the surrounding area and based on the feedback they get they echolocate, they find out where they are. So we added this to uh, our diver who was going underwater and it was polluted and he kept hitting his head into walls. So we added that information, we put emitters and sensors and tried to understand uh, how we can use that information to perceive an environment and mix it with vision and the goal uh, is to use that information. It's, uh, it was an under ongoing research and the goal was to integrate that into an augmented reality where we could just put objects in, a, in, a, in an iPad, for example, the diver is holding and it could see through for him. Then I came to London uh, about six years ago. I started a postdoctoral research fellowship here at CT, the second one and uh, I was uh, working on tennis videos. This time uh, I was looking at tennis players, experts and novices to see what uh, novices don't see and experts see and try to extract those sources of information. And very recently, uh, this was a very long ongoing work and we had a paper published last year in Frontiers of Psychology. So it was a very interesting research and it involved a lot of uh, the previous one involved, involved some diving and this one involved some uh, tennis playing and going to different tournaments and the most difficult bit about it was recruiting expert tennis players. They wouldn't do experiments for 10 pounds an hour. So <laughs> data collection is difficult. And uh, I'm a research associate as well at UCL Institute of Ophthalmology. In this work we are looking at uh, designing a robot. The whole team is working on that very big team. I'm working as a computer vision side, the computer vision side of things. Uh, we are designing a robot that can uh, inject or deliver drugs into a specific micrometer accuracy location. Uh, our group recently cured two blind people. So two people who had gone blind, uh, they injected the stem cells into their retina and now this work is going to improve on that by building a robot that can go exactly where it has to be, where human hand does not have that accuracy. So that robot is going to help uh, do that delivery better. And as I said, I have, been, uh, I have an honorary research associate with King's College and, uh, and another one with Moorfields Eye Hospital. So most of the times I'm at Moorfields Eye Hospital and it's like 10 minutes walk from here. So if you need to see me, we can arrange something and we can meet around here. And uh, since 2016, so this is fourth year now. We are, uh, I used to be co-lecturing with Greg, but since he left about two years ago, now I am uh, the visiting lecturer for computer vision and 
uh, I'm happy the number of students is growing every year. So uh, hopefully next year we will get two rooms at the same time. So overview of uh, today's lecture. First of all, why do we look at biologically inspired vision? Why do we look at humans? Uh, then we will go through human visual system. We will look at some illusions. As I said, this is a fun session, so you will be, uh, you will be watching illusions and uh, they will trick you and you will make a lot of laugh, hopefully. And uh, then we will talk about some biology, very, very basic stuff, what a neuron is, how they interact with each other, and... Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. So uh, uh, we have, uh, then we go through that uh, neurons bit, and then we will have some uh, understanding of perception. So we will see what sensations are, how they work, and then we go through perception, and we will see that sensation and perception are slightly different things. We will uh, look at some uh, basics of simple complex cells, attention and the role of it, and uh, object recognition, gestalt laws, depth perception, and motion perception. Okay. Let's uh, start with Lena, or Lena. Uh, this person, you may see her face a lot uh, in the computer vision. She was basically the cover girl of a Playboy magazine. And once a computer vision scientist wanted an object to try his model, of course, what you find on your desk is a Playboy magazine. And he picked that up. And uh, that picture has been always used uh, a lot in computer vision conferences. And uh, I think two years ago, she was the one uh, opening CVPR, if I'm not mistaken, one of the main conferences in computer vision. She was the invited guest. So um, she's quite famous for that. But that's, uh, anyway. So uh, let's look at images. So let's say you have a camera which has 12 megapixels resolution. Most of the cameras nowadays, they have such a resolution, right? And uh, 12 megapixels means 4,000, say, vertical and 3,000 horizontal, or the other way around, depending on how you hold your phone. So what we have is 12 million pixels. Once uh, we want to go with color images, the way it works is we have three channels. We have red, green, and blue, usually. We have other color channels where you go through them. But red, green, blue, RGB, each of them, we start with eight bits, right? So eight bits means 256 bits if we have uh, like uh, binarized them, if you use them in binary, right? Two times two times two is two to eight, which means 256. So we have 256 different combinations in one byte if you're using binary. And then 256 in the next one and 256 in the next one. So if I have 12 million pixels and each of them has 256 times 256 times 256, what I end up is with 256 to the power of 36 million different possible combinations. And this number is huge. It's more than the number of atoms in the universe. So technically, there is no way that we can store all possible combinations of images, right? Like, even if you have the biggest computers, they, they, they won't be able to store. Because if, if, imagine this is an image of me. If I move like this, this is a totally different space. Because all the bits that were, like, white now are black, and all the bits that were black are now white. So I'm totally in a different location in that huge dimensional space that we had. So it is not possible to store all possible images. So we have to find uh, a solution. There are challenges, illumination, viewpoints, color, scale, occlusions, rotations, shapes. These are all challenges that ch make the exact same object look very different in an image. If you teach a computer program to say this is a phone, if you rotate it like that, your program will not be able to tell this is a phone unless it is trained for that. Our brain does it very, very naturally. Let me show you how much information we want, actually, we actually need. Try to read this. So this message serves to prove, right? Can you start reading it? How our minds can do amazing things, impressive things. <laughs> 
In the beginning, it was hard, but now. So you can see that even the information is not there. It is incomplete. It is wrong, but we still can connect. We still can read that. So our brain doesn't need all the pixels. It doesn't need all exact uh, colors to understand what is around it. It tries to extract some features. So this was a good example to see uh, we don't need the whole environment around us. A part of it might probably do what we need it to do. So uh, is there a reason we need to study human vision? Yes, because it's amazing in understanding things. Taking a photo, computers are much better than us. If I ask you to look at me, close your eyes, five minutes later, I ask you, what color was my watch? You have seen it 10 times already, but you won't remember. But a computer will know that, because it's there. But the computer cannot tell you what is a watch, but you know that, right? So this is the difference. This is where we try to uh, learn from biology and use it in science or in uh, computer vision. So there are pros, of, and pros and cons. There are mistakes. Our brain can be fooled, which we will see today, how it happens. We have limitations. As I said, computers are better in some parts. Human brain is better in the other. So we will learn about challenges in computer vision, which we talked about them briefly. There is a huge space out there. Computer is a dumb machine, doesn't know what is there. We have to teach it. We have to show it thousands of examples. And one of the reasons that computer vision nowadays is so powerful is because of internet. Previously, uh, you needed images of people. You had to go to the street with a very expensive camera, take photos, come back. But now Google images of people and just keep downloading. So you have thousands of resources or whatever you want. And then you can teach your computer to use those. And then once there is an unseen one, it can use it. So we have a lot of data. We have big data and we have good computational power, and we have algorithms that work. So these three things together have been the reason computer vision is so hot these days. So can we learn from biological systems to enhance computer and machine vision? Yes, the answer is deep learning. Deep learning is basically coming from human brain or uh, any mammal's brain. This is, uh, we will get to that. And how much do we know about human visual system? We are not 100% sure what's happening. It's a lot of different possibilities, but we have ideas. So we will go through those ideas. So uh, let me uh, dim the lights a bit. I think it's too. When it goes to watching movies, I'll turn it off. Uh, so how can we study the brain? There are basically two ways to do that. One is called neuroscience, where it's a physical science. It's biology. We look at the structure. We try to cut through the brain and see what is there, what layers we see, what, uh, what is this fatty tissue doing here, and so on. And the other one is psychophysics where we try to run experiments on people uh, uh, and see how they can understand the environment. So uh, neuroscience uh, is traditionally seen as a branch of biology, and psychophysics is, uh, as I said, the relationship between perception and the stimulus. So we show an object to a participant and do different ways. We have like absolute threshold, difference threshold, magnitude estimation, reaction times, see how, how long they take to react. Um, what is the level of light that the, the person can start to see the object that we want and things like that to understand the limits of uh, whether we are studying vision or something else. There is a group here at City University Center for Applied Vision Research, uh, Prof. Solomon, Dr. Yarrow, they are uh, very, very famous uh, people in psychology here that I have had the pleasure of working with them when I was at City. And, uh, they, they are actually doing this, uh, and they have very, very interesting publications. The other way is neuroscience. So one way is to get someone, remove a part of their brain, and see what they cannot do anymore, which is not legal. So what we do is uh, we look for people who've had accidents. 
and they have lost a part of their brain. And then we see what is it that they cannot do anymore, which parts of the brain are damaged, and what is it resulting in. If somebody has that part removed, uh, what uh, tasks they cannot do anymore. And uh, in animals, they did the lesion parts. They removed parts then, and we will get to that. And there are other ways, like EEG, electroencephalogram, where there are, they measure brain waves. It's a, a very important field for those who are doing BCI, brain-computer interaction, and those who are working on like wearing a, a, a kit on your head and controlling a game. So they are working on those signals by uh, st uh, stimulating a, a specific location in the brain and reading signals from another part to see what the decision is, whether it's a go or a stop, for example, basic games. And um, we have CAT scan, computerized axial tomography, which is a sophisticated form of X-ray of the brain. And uh, it looks at the structure again, not function. We have MRI, which is magnetic resonance imaging, which uh, knocks electrons off their orbit and then sees them coming back and takes images. We have PET scan, where you give something to the patient to eat or swallow. And then uh, that is a substance that the machine captures. And uh, like in uh, some of the experiments, they have glucose in it, and the brain needs that. It's the uh, power supply of the brain. So once they activate a function, and they see that uh, there is a high density of sugar in one part of the brain, they see now this part is active. It needs more energy. So they realize this part is now actually doing something. This part is involved. And uh, the functional MRI which is a combination of PET scan and MRI. So these are uh, the ways that they use to understand the brain, but we don't care actually because we now have their results. So let's see what that result is suggesting. The general idea about human brain, the general idea is that there are different parts and each part is responsible for a specific set of tasks. So the main part that we are uh, concerned about is the back of the brain or occipital lobe, the back part, lobe, the back lobe. So that part is basically our uh, visual cortex, is where we see. So we see here, basically. Uh, this is just a sensor. Our eyes are just sensors. There is a cable or optic nerve which transmits data to the back of the brain and all the processing takes place there. And then it goes to temporal lobe or parietal lobe, two different paths which are responsible for where and what. So we will get to that. The other frontal lobe, which is responsible for a specific set of tasks, parietal lobe, which uh, also has some role in vision. We have uh, uh, other parts. So human visual cortex is what we are interested in most. Y yeah, I, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so human visual cortex is what we are interested in. So we have uh, on the back of the brain, uh, if you can see here, so this is our eye. We see the environment. The light is reflected on our retina. The rods and cones, which we will talk about them, transmit and convert light into electric signal. That electric signal goes through this optic nerve, which is our blind spot, which we will have an experiment on that and it goes to the um, LGN. It goes through this area, cables, if you want to think of it, and it comes to the V1. V1 is the first layer of our uh, brain processing information, which is basically detecting edges in the images. It finds edges, and then it goes to V2, V3, 3A, V4, and then there are different layers, MT, and so on. So. Each layer is known to have a specific set of rules in this process. In uh, V1 does the edges, V2 does surfaces, V4 color, uh, MT for motion, and IT for object recognition. So as I said, there are two different pathways. Once we go up this area, we go in and up, we will have uh, the uh, dorsal stream, or where, which helps us understand and locate objects. And we have the um, ventral or what pathway, which helps us identify objects. So if somebody is damaged in this area, they will be able to say, I see an apple. But if you ask them to take the apple or touch it, they will be going randomly. Or the other way around, it, the, the, these other people who have lesions here, 
they will not be able to say what they see, but they can touch it. So this is uh, how they come up with these things. But how much do we actually see? How good are we? Uh, the answer is, imagine this whole wavelength. It starts from 10 to minus 3 nanometers to 10 to 15 nanometers. We only see this bit, which is the visible light. We call it visible because we see it. Doesn't mean other animals see less or more. They probably some see more, some see less. But in humans, in evolution, we have been adopted to learn this bit, to see this bit. And uh, this is called the visible light. And uh, it starts from almost 390 nanometers to 700 nanometers. This is the wavelength that we see. And it starts from blue, goes to green, yellow, red. And then we have infrared, and then we have ultraviolet and x-rays. So this is the visible region. What happens in our eyes is this is a human eye, or any mammal eye, basically, usually. Like cat's eye are very similar to humans, and in most studies, because they cannot like kill humans easily, they go to cats. So most of the experiments are done on cats. So, uh, or were done or maybe they are still done. So this is uh, uh, a human eye. This is the object that we look at, and this is the reflection, the way it's formed on our retina. This is a, a cut or a crop of our retina. So once the light goes in, we have two types of cells here. They are uh, light receptors. They receive light. One of them is called rod. One of them is called cones. So we will go through the differences. But we have an uh, we have a optic nerve here, which is the one that transmits the signals, the, the light that has been converted into electricity to the brain. But how come we see everything completely? If there is a blind spot in our eye, if there is a hole which this cable goes through, how come do we see everything correctly? So what I want you to do is have you done the optic, uh, the, the blind spot experiment in the school? Like, no? No, OK. So, <laughs> yeah, on your driving test. OK, no, that's a different blind spot. <laughs> so, what we need to do is please grab a piece of white paper, everyone. A piece of white paper and follow these instructions. show you and bring you up to speed right away. What I want all of you to do is just go get a piece of white paper. And a lot of you have done this before, and if you've done it, then you need not do it. But those of you that haven't, do this. And what I'm going to have you do is check for your blind spot. What your blind spot is, is it's just where the optic nerve innervates the retina in your eye. And so there are no rods and cones there to receive any input and so you have no incoming signal to the brain from that part of the retina. However, you don't just see a void for any light that's focused onto that area of the eye, and I want to show you what you do see. So get a, a white piece of paper and take a, a pen and just make some uh, two dots about two and a half inches apart and make the dot, you know, a good solid dot, like maybe at least half a centimeter in diameter. Okay, that's as far as we need a video. So uh, do that. <laughs> like six centimeters or two and a half inches apart. Two dots. And now cover your right eye and look at the left dot on that paper. Yeah? Yes, you will hold the paper, and you will, you will find that out. So you hold the paper, cover your right eye, look at the left dot. This is the most important thing. Right eye covered, look at the left dot. And now keep moving it closer and further. 
And at one particular point, you will not see the right dot anymore. Did you see that? No? Keep trying. <laughs> And what I want you to do is to cover your right eye with your palm and hold this paper about 18 inches away from your, you know, directly in front of your left eye and about 18 inches away. And I want you to stare at the right dot of the two dots that you've made that are horizontal with your left eye. So with your left eye, make sure your right eye is covered and stare only at the right dot with your left eye. Make sure that right dot is directly in front of your left eye, about 18, 18 inches in front of you. And then slowly begin to bring that piece of paper towards your eye. And what you're going to find using your peripheral vision, the left dot that you've drawn will disappear. And that is your blind spot, okay? And if you look at the left dot with your left eye, then it will come back. Obviously, this you have to stare at the right dot. Okay. <laughs> Worked? No, you don't have a blind spot. <laughs> so, uh, how many didn't work for? You should see a doctor. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We all have that blind spot. Keep doing that experiment and uh, you will see that. So what happens here, uh, so what happens here is that our brain is recovering, it's recovering for us. That there, is, there are two blind spots. In each eye there is one. And our brain is just sorting it out for us. It just helps us see things. Our nose, is just in the middle of our vision. But our brain has learned to eliminate it for us. Because we have two eyes, we have a stereo vision, the brain has learned to eliminate it. Otherwise, if you put a nose in front, like a nose-like thing in front of two cameras here, you will see a constant bit of nose in front of your images. But our brain, it depends on the size of your nose. But, it <laughs> uh, but the brain has learned to eliminate that. So our brain is doing a lot of processing that we are not even aware of. It's covering a blind spot for us. So don't trust your eyes anymore. And uh, the next thing is, let's look at speed of processing. How much time does our brain need to do all this processing? I'm going to show you the next slide very quickly. And I want you to tell me which picture, left or right, contains an animal. Are you ready? See, you see, you had just a fraction of a second to go through that, but you can quickly see that because you need that. In nature, which we used to live 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, no longer these days, you had to be able to detect an animal. It was vital for your survival. We are, most of us are afraid of spiders. That's because we have to. They, they, they might be very dangerous uh, creatures that would kill us. So this is very natural. This is built in in our system for millions of years of evolution. So we have to be able to quickly tell. And the time our brain needs is about 150 milliseconds to process this whole path to go through the eye to the brain to be processed. OK, I saw an animal. It's just a fraction of a second. So our brain is super fast. Computers were not. But nowadays, they are, unfortunately. So what we have here is that uh, our, our brain works really fast. And it can uh, understand things. It can effortlessly perceive scenes that are very, very difficult for a computer still to this day. If I show you this image and I ask you what you see, it would be easy to say you see probably a couple of bees like around each other, not the insect. But you see some letter B, and it's covered with some ink. But for a computer program to say that, it's really, really difficult, even nowadays. So uh, our brain is using a lot of resources, a lot of techniques that it has learned throughout time, through nature, through evolution, to understand how to put these pieces together so that we survive, so that we can detect an animal, we can run away, and so on. So. Uh, 
Okay, this isn't supposed to be like that. I don't know, this uh, MacBook doesn't like these drivers anymore. Okay, so limits of the visual system. Uh, are we perfect then? Is our brain complete? The answer is no. We can fool the brain as well and we can reach the capacity. So if, you, if you're given a car, you try to go as fast as possible to see what is the zero to 60 of this car, and you try to test it to the, uh, if it's not your car, you try to test it to the limit to see how good this car is. But this is the way we do it with uh, different machines, with uh, human brain. We, we try to see what are the limitations and how we can uh, fool the brain. Let's have a look at this image, for example. What do we see? We see a scene that doesn't make sense, but it makes sense, and it doesn't make sense, and it makes sense, and so on. So our brain tries to make sense of the scene, but this is a computer-generated scene. It doesn't exist. It's impossible physically or uh, geometrically to have uh, such a scene. But our brain tries to understand it. So it says, OK, these are stairs up. And then once it reaches a point, it doesn't understand it anymore that these are stairs up or down. So uh, things like that. But our brain is also very powerful. How much do we see in this image? Horses. Yeah, but why do we see them? Because we have seen horses before. And our brain can understand from this scene that this is not just some random rocks covered by snow. There are some actually horses in those images. And, uh, okay, and uh, we have a visual search task here. Find a green horizontal bar. Oh, it's very simple, right? But if I make it a little bit more difficult, I add some noise to that. It is a bit more difficult. For previous one, it was obvious. You could just find it. But for this one, you probably should look at the whole image once, go through it, and then you will find it. So these are the things that we use to understand human brain. Uh, Look at the center for like 10, 15 seconds to the, to the cross in the middle, to the plus in the middle. Do you see green? But why? There is no green. So we will go through that, right? And the, the purple is going away. It's fading, right? It's fading and it's being covered by green. And if you keep rotating your eye now around the image, you see that it's going away as you go, as you rotate your eye. So this is an interesting one. Look at this one. Look at the uh, connection point here in the middle. Here. Look at this point for like 10 seconds. Now, look at this one. See, the colors are now opposite, and the one that is open, the color is going out of it. So what's happening? Look at this one. Um, this one and this one are the same color, right? What about this one and this one? They look very different, regardless of whether you have seen this experiment before or not, right? So <laughs> this one and this one look totally different. This is orange and this is brown. But what I'm doing is I'm going to cover the rest of the image except those two points. If you don't believe me, you can just cover your screen later. Just make a hole in your... <laughs> See, they, 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 they don't look the same, but if you copy this image, go to Photoshop, look for the exact color values, these two areas are exactly the same color. Our brain perceives things based on the sensory information in higher layers in our brain, we perceive things. We don't basically use the exact sensation. Our, our brain tries to make sense of the environment. And in that environment, they don't look the same. So our brain says, no, they are not the same. But 
because this is again another uh, doctored image. And this one is another interesting one. If you look at any area, any dot here, you see it's uh, stationary, but the area around it is moving. Our brain is not used to these images. We don't see them in daily life in jungles where we lived before. But now on a computer program, when it's there, the brain is confused. And uh, surfaces. What do we see here on the left? You see a triangle on top of another one. But it doesn't actually exist. There is no triangle. We are making it. It is like some cropped circles and some lines. But we, are, we, are, we see that triangle because it makes sense. It doesn't exist, but we see it. Or this one, what do you see? Do you see the lady here? Again, it doesn't exist, but because we are used to it, we see it. And the last one before the break is if you look at this, po this point here for like 20 seconds and then look at this image, you will see that these two are not exactly the same. This is a photo of a sandy area. So you see the colors are different now when you look at those two. These are after, after effects. So I'm going to let you have a 10 minutes break while I'm going to show this video. If you are interested, you can uh, watch this. If not, just take a break and uh, have some water and whatever. I want to start with a game. Okay, and to win this game, all you have to do is see the. Re yes. All right. So we have two panels here of colored dots, and one of those dots is the same in the two panels. Okay, and you have to tell me which one. Now I'll narrow it down to the gray one, the green one, and say the orange one. So by a show of hands. We'll start with the easiest one. Show of hands, how many people think it's the gray one? Really? Okay. How many people think it's the green one? And how many people think it's the orange one? So pretty even split. So let's find out what the reality is. Here is the orange one. All right. Here is the green one. And here's the gray one. <laughs> so for all of you who saw that, you're a complete realist. All right? So this is pretty amazing, actually, isn't it? Because nearly every living system has evolved the ability to detect light in one way or another. So for us, seeing color is one of the simplest things the brain does. And yet, even at this most fundamental level, context is everything. Okay? What I'm going to talk about is not that context is everything, but why is context everything? Because it's answering that question that tells us not only why we see what we do, but who we are as individuals and who we are as a society. But first we have to ask another question, which is, what is color for? And instead of telling you, I'll just show you. What you see here is a jungle scene, and you see the surfaces according to the amount of light that those surfaces reflect. Now, can any of you see the predator that's about to jump out at you? And if you haven't seen it yet, you're dead, right? Can anyone see it? Anyone? No? Now, let's see the surfaces according to the quality of light that they reflect. And now you see it, right? So, color enables us to see the similarities and differences between surfaces according to the full spectrum of light that they reflect. But what you've just done is, in many respects, mathematically impossible. Why? Because, as Barclay tells us, we have no direct access to our physical world other than through our senses. 
And the light that falls onto our eyes is determined by multiple things in the world. Not only the color of objects, but also the color of their illumination and the color of the space between us and those objects. You vary any one of those parameters and you'll change the color of the light that falls onto your eye. This is a huge problem because it means that the same image could have an infinite number of possible real-world sources. So let me show you what I mean. Imagine that this is the back of your eye, okay? And these are two projections from the world. They're identical in every single way. Identical in shape, size, spectral content. They are the same as far as your eye is concerned. And yet, they come from completely different sources. The one on the right comes from a yellow surface in shadow, oriented facing the left, viewed through a pinkish medium. The one on the left comes from an orange surface under direct light, facing to the right, viewed through a sort of a bluish medium. Completely different meanings, giving rise to the exact same retinal information. And yet, it's only the retinal information that we get. So how on earth do we even see? So if you remember anything in this next 18 minutes, remember this, that the light that falls onto your eye, sensory information, is meaningless because it could mean literally anything. And what's true for sensory information is true for information generally. There's no inherent meaning in information. It's what we do with that information that matters. So how do we see? Well, we see by learning to see. So the brain evolved the mechanisms for finding patterns, finding relationships in information, and associating those relationships with a behavioral meaning, a significance, by interacting with the world. We're very aware of this in the form of more cognitive attributes, like language. So I'm going to give you some letter strings, and I want you to read them out for me, if you can. What are you reading? Half the letters are missing, right? There's no a prior reason why an H has to go between that W and A, but you put one there. Why? Because in the statistics of your past experience, it would have been useful to do so. So you do so again. And yet you don't put a letter after that first T. Why? Because it wouldn't have been useful in the past. So you don't do it again. So let me show you how quickly our brains can redefine normality, even at the simplest thing the brain does, which is color. So if I could have the lights down up here, I want you to first notice that those two desert scenes are physically the same. One is simply the flipping of the other. Okay? Now I want you to look at that dot between the green and the red. Okay? And I want you to just stare at that dot. Don't look anywhere else. And we're going to look at that for about 30 seconds, which is a bit of a killer in an 18-minute talk. <laughs> okay? But I really want you to learn. And I'll tell you, don't look anywhere else. And I'll tell you what's happening inside your head. Your brain is learning. And it's learning that the right side of its visual field is under red illumination. The left side of its visual field is under green illumination. That's what it's learning. Okay? Now, when I tell you, I want you to look at the dot between the two desert scenes. So why don't you do that now? Can we have the lights up again? So I take it from your response, they don't look the same anymore, right? Why? Because your brain is seeing that same information as if the right one is still under red light and the left one is still under green light. That's your new normal, okay? So what does this mean for context? It means I can take these two identical squares and I can put them in light and dark surrounds. Now the one on the dark surround looks lighter than the one on the light surround. What's significant is not simply the light and dark surrounds that matter. It's what those light and dark surrounds meant for your behavior in the past. So I'll show you what I mean. Here we have that exact same illusion. We have two identical tiles on the left, one in a dark surround, one in a light surround, and the same thing over on the right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal those two scenes but I'm not going to change anything within those boxes, except their meaning, and see what happens to your perception. Notice that on the left, the two tiles look nearly completely opposite, one very white and one very dark, right? Whereas on the right, the two tiles look nearly the same. And yet, there is still one on a dark surround and one on a light surround. Why? Because if the tile in that shadow were in fact in shadow, and reflecting the same amount of light to your eye as the one outside the shadow, it would have to be more reflective, just the laws of physics. So you see it that way. Whereas on the right, the information is consistent with those two tiles being under the same light. 
if they're under the same light, reflecting the same amount of light to your eye, then they must be equally reflective. So you see it that way. Which means we can bring all this information together to create some incredibly strong illusions. This is one I made a few years ago. And you'll notice you see a dark brown tile at the top and a bright orange tile at the side. That is your perceptual reality. The physical reality is that those two tiles are the same. Here you see four gray tiles on your left, seven gray tiles on the right. I'm not going to change those tiles at all, but I'm going to reveal the rest of the scene and see what happens to your perception. The four blue tiles on the left are gray. The seven yellow tiles on the right are also gray. They are the same, okay? Don't believe me? Let's watch it again. Um, I think everyone is back, so uh, let's continue. So uh, we saw some illusions, and now we are going to look at the brain and see, you know, in a little bit more detail, not too much detail, to see what's happening in the brain. So as discussed before, there are different parts in our brain, but the building block of our brain is a neuron. What is a neuron actually made of? So. In this image, we have a, look, a closer look at neurons. As you can see, the main components of a neuron, or as you know already probably, is the cell body, it's the dendrites, and the axon or nerve fiber. So dendrites are the inputs of the neuron. It's a lot of connections, a lot of, uh, let's call it hands, that are open to receive information. And then we have one output from each neuron, which is one axon. So the, as you can look here, the end of axon is, again, a lot of branches in it. And these branches connect, not physically, but they go very, very close to other neurons, uh, dendrites, and they communicate with each other this way. So uh, the way this happens is through ions that carry an electrical charge. There's, there is a solution around them which contains ions. It has uh, sodium, uh, potassium, and uh, chlorine. And it has positive and negative charges. We don't want to go through too much details of what exactly is happening here. But what we need to know is uh, there are about 100 billion neurons in the brain. And each neuron has about up to a thousand, around a thousand connections with other neurons. So we end up with having a hundred to a thousand tri uh, trillion synapses. That is why it's very difficult to study brain. There is a huge amount of connections, and if you stimulate the brain by some uh, stimuli, it's very, very difficult to see what exactly is happening. But the important thing here is that there are two sorts of outputs coming or going from a neuron. One is excitatory. When a neuron is responding to something, they start firing. And one is the inhibitory. They start to reduce the firing of their neighboring neurons. So if they are activated, they are excited, they start exciting their neighbors, and it keeps going and going, and it's reduced uh, physically. As, as the further they get, the less effect they have on each other. But the closer they are to each other, neurons, they have more effect on each other. And the other one is the inhibitory, the ones that reduce the activity of the neighboring neurons. So uh, 
these are the two types that we are concerned about, excitatory, and they uh, create action potentials, which means they start firing their neighbors, and the inhibitory ones. The way they do this processing is if you want to go into a neuron level, you want to go so, so small and deep, you have to either in, uh, enter your electrode inside a neuron, which is a very aggressive way, and it usually kills the neuron after a few times of firing, or you can keep it in the middle of a few neurons and uh, do your readings from there. But these methods, all of them are very, very aggressive. And if you do that, usually the animal is dead after a few readings. So they don't do that anymore. Or uh, they, they do less aggressive methods like EEG, for example, to read the, the uh, reaction of neurons. So they are intracellular and extracellular recordings. So let's go back to eye. Now we have a general understanding, a very, very basic understanding, that once a neuron sees something, for example, is activated, is, and then it starts to activate, and this signal is propagated. So once we see something, that signal is converted to electricity, it starts activating neurons, and they keep activating each other, the neighboring ones, and it goes to the brain and goes up to the higher levels. So let's go back to the eye. So this is our eye. We see an image. We know now that, except a few of you, we all have optic nerves. And uh, there, I'm sure you all have it. So we have a region here, which is the center of our visual field, which is our fovea. This point is the most important point in our vision. It is only 0.01% of retina but it is the most important part. It is our central vision. It is in the center called macula, which is the center of the, the, the back of the retina. And this is our focal point where everything is focused on that. Everything we see is focused on our fovea. The rest of retina is not that important. So if somebody one day wants to take one part of your retina, just don't go for this part. So there are two types of cells in it. There are rods. They are and cones. Rods look like this. They are large and cylindrical. And the cones are small and tapered. Which one is more important, rods or cones? Rods, cones? Yeah. So this is our fovea. This is the important part. As you can see, fovea is full of cones. And the rest of our areas have a lot of Rods. Rods are sensitive to light. They, they, are, they are much more sensitive to light. But cones need good amount of light to perceive color. So if you enter a dark room, it's very dark, no light in it. You don't see anything. But after like a few seconds that you stay in that room, if there is a smaller source of light, you start to see things, right? This is the time that it takes your rod to activate. Then you start to see things, but you see no color. But once you turn the light on, there is enough light, then you will see color, because that is when your rods come in action. So rods are very important, and they are the, the cells that have three types. They help us see color. So uh, they are mainly in fovea a lot of them, and there are less in the peripheral vision. And unlike uh, the, the, the other way around, the rods are in the peripheral vision and almost none in the fovea. So we have uh, three different spectral sensitivities from cones. So we have short, medium, and long wavelengths they can detect, three different kinds of cones, and this is rods sensitivity. So they are good for uh, detecting light, and these are good for having color. If a person is missing one sort of rod, uh, cones, let's say someone is missing M cones, for example, they are called colorblind, which is very common in men. And it, so not very common. It's more common in men than in women. Uh, so this is, if you see these two images exactly the same, then you're colorblind. So uh, the, the thing is, these people are missing the M cones. 
the medium lens one. So they cannot see the, uh, the reds and greens look alike to them. Uh, but is that all to rods and cones? So everything is either uh, in uh, the, 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 these uh, cells start firing at a specific rate. So once for a specific point, it's like computers, they have RGB. So each of them has a value between zero and something. So they start firing and then the brain understands that this is probably purple or blue or whatever. But there is more to that. Let's focus on this dot here for like 10, 20 seconds. Ready? Still focused. I'm going to the next slide. So what's happening? Uh, this is a gray color. It's no color in it. A uh, gray image, gray color image. So what's happening is <clears throat> in our brain, these different cones they have connections with each other as well. They call it, this is called the opponent process theory. It says that uh, M and L, medium and long wavelength <coughs> cones, they have connections and they are opposing each other. So uh, if you want more details about this, you can have a look at this link. But generally the idea is that we have blue positive, yellow negative, green positive, red negative, and the other way around, green negative or positive connections, which are told to happen both in V1, in retina, and in the um, LGN. It's less in V1, but anyway. And the other thing that is interesting is, as I said, fovea just takes 0.01% uh, of retina, but 10% of our visual cortex is dedicated to fovea. Because most of what we see is in our fovea. This is the center of our attention. Most of what we see is there, and the rest of our peripheral vision is mainly sensitive to movements because we needed that in nature. We had to be able to detect a moving animal. So the rest of this area is detecting motion, but our focus, where we are looking at, is our center of vision. And our, our brain keeps, the, the, keeps hold of the image that we are looking at. So if I'm in the classroom and I move my head, the image in my head is moving, but my brain keeps the room steady. So I don't see the room moving. Also, that is moving, actually. When I move my head, my vision is moving, but I, my brain keeps it steady. So this area is very, very important, the fovea part. And uh, having 10% of the, occip uh, the, the occipital lobe, it provides us with a lot of computational power to, to see details. But how does it actually look? If I look at uh, an image, what portions look like on the back of my brain is like this. So this is how our brain actually receives input from the environment and then processes it and then we can see uh, these people. So now we know that fovea is very important. The, the light has been converted to electric signal sent through the back of the brain, and now it's here. It's in my V1. What is there in my V1? There are some cells that they are called center surround. What they do is if there is a stimuli inside them, or similar, inside them, and there is nothing around it, they start firing. Right? So they are detecting edges, like, for example, this is an edge. So if that particular cell is looking at an area that there is something in the middle, but nothing around it, it starts firing. So these are called simple cells in our brain. Or in uh, early models of deep learning, they are called S cells. So this is where deep learning is now connecting to human brain. So we have simple cells that have, uh, they, are, they are organized in cortical columns. So the cells that are in this column, they only respond to vertical light. The cells that are uh, in, on this column, they respond to oriented light. So this is the way we detect different edges. 
And the edges are the most important thing in detecting the boundaries of an object. When you look at me, your brain is detecting the edges around me to differentiate me from the background. And then you have an image of me or any other object in the room. So uh, this is the way simple cells work. So they are center surround receptive fields. They are uh, concentric cells, and the, the connection of these gives you the simple cell. And they are uh, very good in responding to spots of light and to the bar of light oriented along the length of the receptive field. So if you're looking at a vertical receptive field area, they respond. But if you show the same area, a horizontal bar, it doesn't fire. But if you show a vertical bar, it starts firing. So this is the way simple cells help us detect edges. And then we have complex cells. Complex cells are the ones that get the output of a few simple cells. So in deep learning, they are called C cells, complex cells. So we have S and C, and they keep doing that. S, C, S, C, S, C, and then they build the model. So what these do is they get the output from different cells, and then they fire. We have complex end stop cells, which uh, are uh, selective to orientation, motion, and direction. And if the stimuli is too long, they don't fire. It means this is too big from my receptive field. Higher levels will be able to detect that. So there is a hierarchy of cells here. Uh, there is a very interesting problem, which is called the aperture problem. We are going to visit that again today. But what is the orientation of this movement? It's a diagonal one, right? It's going to top left, bottom right, right? Anyone disagrees? No? OK. So let me show you. This is now you're looking at one edge. This is the problem that our brain has, and it has to constant because <clears throat> a set of cells are only looking at this area, right? So they see this movement. But if I, look, if I show you the whole square, it is a totally different orientation of movement. Now it is making sense. So each of these cells <clears throat> is only looking at, so keep focusing on this area to make sure there is no trick around behind. So each of these cells is only looking through a small aperture, through a small hole. And through that small hole, this movement looks like that. But once they are connected to each other, the big picture is created, our brain can see this. Okay. The other interesting thing is that we learn orientations throughout are, uh, are growing up. Like when a kid, a baby is born, they don't have these filters built in their brain. They start learning. So in one experiment they did is they put some kittens inside a, a, an environment where there were no uh, horizontal bars. Everything was vertical. And they lived there for a few months. And once they were moved out, they couldn't detect horizontal edges. They only could see vertical edges. So our brains have the capacity to, to train themselves from natural images that they are exposed to. Again, this is what's happening in deep learning. They give them images, and the model learns those weights. In previous models, you, we used to give them filters. We used to tell them, OK, this is an edge detector. This is a corner detector. This is this, this is that. But nowadays, models are learning from those images, and they are extracting their own filters. This is what our brain is doing. Our brain is learning that I need to detect all these orientations because they are in the environment around me. So we are learning constantly. And then in higher layers, so now we talked about V1, what happens in V1. Now we go higher in V2, V4. In V2, we respond to illusory contours, like the rectangle you see on top of these circles. We uh, get the signal board border ownership and understand surfaces, create representations of them. In V4, we respond to perceived light, to perceived color, rather than the actual wavelengths. That is why in those images what you saw was not actually the, the, uh, what it was there. You perceive them. 
it's different sometimes. So uh, there is a difference between sensing and perceiving. We both look at this and say it's red, pink, or whatever, but what we see, what we perceive, might be different from one person to another. That's why all of those illusions about that blue clothes and golden clothes was up for a while. People were asking which color is this and so on. So uh, perception is different from sensation. This is the moral of the story here. And in our empty, then we start the understanding perceived motion. I will have some illusions on motion later. So we perceive the movements around us, like that uh, illusion you saw objects are moving. That's also happening in the empty area. So this is an explanation of what uh, ablation experiments do. So they teach the animal a specific trick. So once it sees uh, uh, some uh, task, it's trained to do something, they, they disreward it. And then they take the animal, remove a part of the brain, and then they see what uh, capabilities are affected. This is a bit. Uh, difficult, uh, so I, I think in many countries is now illegal and they don't do that anymore, so don't worry. But uh, this is the way they understood basically these areas exist. So we have this uh, dorsal pathway, or where or how, and we have the ventral pathway, or where. As explained, if there are parts removed from these pathways, it results in different um, uh, abilities. <clears throat> so, uh, the challenges that we have are different viewpoints, color, scale, background, occlusions, shapes, rotation. These are some images from a famous data set called uh, Caltech 101, and there is Caltech 256. Once you come up with a computer vision algorithm, you want to compare your results with the others. So the way they do it normally is there are standard data sets online. You apply your model on it and you say, okay, I achieved 90% accuracy on classifying 100 classes of images from each other and so on. Nowadays, the, these are like old days, but uh, nowadays they're working on like ImageNet, which has millions of images. And most of these models are trained on ImageNet and then they are applied on different things. So what we need to do is we need to uh, be able to come to a trade-off between selectivity and invariance. Selectivity means I should be able to tell this is a dinosaur, this is a dinosaur, and so is this one. And then I have to uh, be able to say this is not a dinosaur, this is not a dinosaur, and this is not a dinosaur. So that is selectivity between is and is not. And then invariance, all of these are dinosaurs. So my code should be able to detect this regardless of its color, its orientation, and so on. So we are always in computer vision looking for a trade-off between selectivity and invariance. If your code detects everything as cancer, it's useless. And if it detects everything as non-cancer, it's useless. It has to be selective. It should be able to tell you. But if you have two different types of cancer cells, it should detect both as cancer cells. So it has to be invariant. If one of them is rotated a bit or is occluded a bit, it has to still be able to detect it. So this is... So what we do later, we will convert each of these images into a feature vector. So it's usually a feature vector of one in 5,000, 10,000 dimension numbers. And then we have those numbers that are sent to the uh, machine learning code. So that is how we keep them. We don't work with the actual size images. That's impossible. That's very, very memory uh, expensive. Because each image might be 10 megapixels. So we convert everything to a small vector. They're all numbers. And how we achieve that vector, it depends on the way we are going with that. So our mind, our, our uh, brain, also has some trouble. It needs to be able to say these three objects are different, whereas the image that is reflected on our retina is exactly the same thing, right? But our brain needs more cues. What it does is one of the basic things that our brain has is two sensory inputs. We have two eyes, so we have a stereo vision. And if you close one eye and then the other, you will see that the image shifts a little bit, right? So this small shift 
is what helps is one of the sources that our brain uses to understand the environment around it. And we will go through that later. But our brain is always looking for simplicity, for making sense of things. Uh, one of the ways that these things are um, explained in our brain is Gestalt laws, which if I ask you what you see in this image, you probably don't see much, but yes, very well. Uh, here is a dog, Dalmatian dog. See it now? Yep. But if you, if you don't look for a dog, you probably see a lot of noise, like black and white noise. But if you look at it, you see a dog here. So there are some laws to explain that our brain is always going for simplicity. Look at this image. What do you see? Do you see five circles on top of each other, or do you see this? You don't see this. Your brain is learned to try to make things as simple as possible, explain things. And on the left, you see some group of red dots. So you see, I see one group. But on the right, you say, I see two groups. So it tries to group similar things together. Here, again, one group, but here you don't see columns anymore. You're looking at uh, rows because they are closer. So being near each other is changing that. Again, it looks for good continuation. You don't see a lot of cropped lines. You see one path, which is going on top of and under, each, uh, under itself. You see common fate. Things that are moving in the same direction are grouped together. You see this is a flock of birds in this orientation direction, and this is another one. And then meaningfulness. What do you see in this image? And if you start looking closer, what is this? This is a face. But initially, you didn't see that, right? Eyes and the mouse. Because it doesn't make sense. You don't have faces in the stone. But hey, yeah, there is another one here, and another one. And another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. So initially you didn't see that because you're not used to that. But once you see that, once you look for a face, then you keep finding more because now you have some top-down feedback. So the whole process in our brain is not only bottom-up. It doesn't only go from uh, the back of the brain to the higher levels. It also has feedback, and it comes back. And simulating that feedback is very, very difficult. Things that are in a common region are grouped together. So if you see a web page like that, you can connect less than if you see it like that, because it's now grouping things together. You, it makes it easier for you. And one of the interesting ones is closure, the one that we saw in that uh, color running experiment, that color was running out of it. So in this one, you don't see much. But in this one, you see a circle because it is a closed area. It is more meaningful. You, you are more, we are more used to that. And uh, the other one is uniform connectedness. These objects are seen as one, and uh, things that are together are uh, grouped belonging together. I'm going to show you a video about attention. So I hope you're paying attention. Who done it? I think for this one, it's uh, best if I go to a bit less light. Don't sleep. Comfortable, everyone? Thanks. So let's watch this video, and then we have a few more to watch after this. If I just can find my mouse. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Oh, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. That's fine, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question 
is how observant were you? Did you notice any changes? How many? 21? <laughs> Let's watch it. Do you want to watch it again or no? Yes. The thing is, I don't have a mouse on it. Oh, yeah, OK. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Right, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest... Lady Smythe. So this was an ad for uh, trying to look out for bikes. Let's watch another one. Okay, here's a test for you. I want you to watch this next film. It shows a group of people passing lunch boxes from one to another. What you've got to do is count the number of times this lunch box is passed from person to person. Now, it moves quite quickly, so you'll have to watch closely. So, all you have to do is keep an eye on that black lunch box as it goes from hand to hand, counting the number of passes that are made between the brainiacs. Okay, how many times was it passed around? If you said 12, then well done. But did you notice anything else in the film? Watch it again, only this time don't bother counting the passes. A film like this was recently shown to a group of 400 people. When they were told just to watch this sequence, not to count the passes, most people easily spot the, yes, Brainiac in a bee suit. She was on screen for a full six seconds, but did you spot her? In the test group, less than 10% of people noticed her first time round. Scientists call this inattentive blindness. It happens because we have a limited ability to absorb and remember detail when our brain is overloaded with information. But well, we've done another experiment as part of this show. We want you to tell us if it's worked. Throughout the programme, we've included a number of deliberate visual errors. Did you spot any of them? Well, here they are. In 101 uses for a week, after... Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's enough of that. Uh, the other one is this one. Oh, this and, is a movie perception. This is just very similar to what you saw. I think this is... This is a test of selective really attention. Same. Really Count how many times the players wearing this white is a test of the basketball. Okay. Um, just uh, give me a second. I think... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think the links are wrong.
VJ, yep, and this one. They shouldn't be the same. This is a movie perception test. Oh yeah, this is the one. Watch this brief silent movie and then I'll ask you some questions about it. You saw a person get up from a desk to answer a phone, right? Did you notice anything change during the video? The video had two different actors wearing different clothing. Watch it again. Okay. So most people don't notice the change, a phenomenon known as change blindness. This video is from research by Daniel Levin and Daniel Simon. So our brain is not good after all. Okay. Uh, let's get back the lights on. All right. So uh, attention is very, very important. Why? Because as I said, most of what we see is in the fovea, is in the center of our visual field. It's what we see actually. The rest, the peripheral vision is not that important. And also attention means we are focusing on that. Our brain is processing that information. So texting and driving is no matter how good you are in driving, you won't be looking around you. You won't be able to understand. You won't be able to sense around you. So don't do that. And uh, so the, the thing is, sometimes things attract our attention. So there, were, there are other examples, like uh, if you are in a, in a classroom and uh, an insect starts just flying around you, that attracts your attention. And uh, if you're looking at a, at a white scene and there is a red object in the middle, that attracts your attention. So these are the things that are salient points. When we are doing uh, image processing or computer vision stuff, we look for those salient points because they are distinctive. If you find some area, some object that is different from the rest of it, it attracts your attention. It is a useful point for understanding the scene, for classifying objects, and we look for those points in our uh, computer vision points. They are also using that for advertisements. So they use colors that attract our attention. They use things to uh, combinations of colors that attract our attentions to, to look at things and keep looking and remember the brand and things like that. Uh, the other thing is our depth perception, how we perceive depths around us. There are some clues. For example, if you look at this image, this part of occlusion here shows and tells you that this object is behind the other one. And here, because the occlusion is the other way around, you, th you think this object is in front of it. Whereas physically, these three objects are exactly in the same place in these images. But this occlusion here is helping you, this occlusion here is helping, and this shadow here is also helping you to perceive depths. So these are the clues that our brain uses for perceiving depths. There are uh, oculomotor cues. Our uh, eyes, they have muscles, and once these muscles are stretched or uh, relaxed, it sends a signal to the brain to help detect the depths that we are looking at. So the eyeball is uh, where the whole image is trajected on it, right? So if you have a curved eyeball, or your eyeball doesn't have a standard shape that it comes naturally, or it's uh, for natural vision, then you put on glasses to change the center, of it, uh, the, the, the center of trajectory. So that helps to bring that forward or backward. So one of the ways that our brain understands depths is looking those muscles that are controlling that lens, right? So the other one is monocular depth cues, like occlusion, which means two objects are covering in front of each other. You can't see behind them. Uh, relative height, relative size, perspective convergence, and so on. We have motion-produced cues. Once 
with motion of objects, you can understand that they are in front or behind each other. We have binocular disparity, which comes from two eyes. Once we have two eyes, and the disparity between those two helps us understand the depths. And uh, they can be combined or put into conflict. So our brain is the one that decides uh, where, where uh, these objects are. And in V1 and extra street areas, including MT, we have uh, preferences for binuclear disparity. If you look at these two images, we have two lines here, which are definitely not the same size. Like if I show you on this line, just eliminate the background and put it on these two. Again, these two are not the same size. This one is longer than this one. But if I remove those lines, then they are exactly the same size. So this is another example of how our brain can be fooled. But we don't see this thing in a natural setting. And if we see it, this definitely means this is longer than this. But in a computer setup, you can just say, yeah, these are the same size. So our brain is used to natural images. If you, you, if you see this thing in a natural environment, they, this is definitely bigger than this one. And these two lines are exactly the same size, but because of convergence and divergence on top, you see them different. And you see this one is smaller than this one. But these two are exactly the same size. Uh, the last one is the motion perception. And this is also a very important evolutionary feature that we have. Some animals freeze when they are in danger because some other animals that are happily going to eat them, they cannot detect them if they are frozen. They need that motion to be able to see the frozen, uh, to be able to see their prey. So uh, motion is also very, very important for our survival, and we are very, very good in detecting motion. If there is a small movement, even if I'm looking here, if there is a small movement outside the window, I can detect it because my peripheral vision is tuned to that. I can see motion around me so that I can survive. And uh, again, movies and videos are made from uh, the limitation of our brain from uh, processing several frames. So if you remember those uh, papers like uh, notebooks we had that we could just scroll through them and see a movie, if you show an image 24 times a second, our brain is not able to detect move, uh, like that this is frames it will see it as a constant movement. So our limit is 24 frames per second. So for nowadays, um, if they want to show us a very high quality video, they put it at 30 frames, or for laptops, it's like 60 frames per second. And then you will no longer be able to know that you are actually looking at 60 images in a second. You think that this is constantly there. This is constantly there, but in, in, in fact, it is an image that is being refreshed 30 times a second or 60 times a second. If you film a light, you will see that. Sometimes you see it's turning on and off because the lights around us, they are AC, and they turn on and off 50 times per second. But because it is happening so fast and it's over our understanding, we see all the lights as always on or always off where in effect, they are turning on and off 50 times per second. So that is another limitation that we can use to see uh, motion. And uh, this, these two videos are the last we are going to watch today. Look at this blue dot for 30 seconds. Look at the blue one again for 20 seconds. See the water moving, right? It's the after effect. It's because your brain is now tuned to the movement and suddenly it stops, so it just adapts it to that. 
and uh, another one to see how much information we actually need. Look at this video. With only 10 points or 12 points, how many are they? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 ish? With only 15 points, you can detect movement. What's happening? It's going up the stairs, downstairs. Yep. In a car, I would say. <laughs> yeah, what is it doing? So you see, we don't need all the information. Only a little bit of that is enough for our brain to understand what's happening around it. So we are going to use that in our advantage in computer vision to see as little, uh, to use as little information as we can so that our models are faster, they are more, uh, the, for that trade-off you remember, they are more invariant, and then try to find a good selectivity as well. So normally neurons in MT are responsible for general motion perception. And uh, so that's it for the slides for today. There are some readings, and you can uh, go for different, if you are interested in illusions, you can look for this. You can look at different uh, websites. As I mentioned, most of the materials covered for tonight are in the book uh, Sensation and Perception. It's available in the library, and it not only cl includes vision, but also other sensory information. So uh, one last thing. Uh, as I mentioned, tonight we have a lab but it is on basic MATLAB. So if you are familiar with MATLAB and you have done MATLAB before, you don't have to attend. But if you are not and you want to see how labs are run, uh, feel free to join us in the lab. Uh, Abby and Alex are outside as well. Uh, maybe, yeah, we can talk to them later about that. Also, um, Yeah, uh, next week we will be talking about how computers see images, what basic processing in computers are happening. And uh, I usually take a few students for supervision on computer vision. So that's me and that's going to be you. Uh, 